Bush, he's a Richmond State Chandler. Especially here on the... Well, good morning and welcome to you on this third Sunday of Advent. It's a joy to have you gathered for worship as we draw closer to our Christmas celebration. But throughout all of these Advent readings we've been hearing and all of our Advent sermons and all of our Advent worship, we're looking at the bigger picture, not just looking back at the birth of Jesus, but looking for ways in which God shows up in our lives constantly, every day. In our confirmation class this morning, we talked a little bit about that, and it was a joy to be with the kids and to talk about how God is present in our lives today. Several announcements uh, are on the screen above me, but there's a couple others I need to highlight. First of all, before I do that, a warm welcome to those who are visiting with us today. Thank you for being here. And to those who are tuned in and watching us online, we appreciate your presence too, even if it's at a distance. I was asked to announce that the Share the Warmth uh, program, the, the, the uh, shelter in Adrian, it's our turn to provide um, uh, food items for December 19th, so there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex if you'd like to sign up to bring something for that. Also wanted to mention that uh, the, uh, the book that is in the narthex, is, I think there's one copy left out there, Manna and Mercy. We're going to be starting a study of this book on January 9th. It's a Sunday. And I do have a few extra copies, but I haven't put them out. So if you would like a copy of that book, I think there's one left out there. Talk to me. I'll be happy to get one to you. If you take one, um, I'm counting on you being there on January 9th. We're looking at probably four Sundays meeting uh, and, and going through that book. It's, it's going to be a fast-paced but exciting study. I hope you can take part in it. Wanted to also mention that today we welcome Lois Hall as our, as our pianist. And Lois is uh, new to us, 
Uh, Barb is uh, under the weather today, so Lois is filling in, and she's going to be playing throughout January when Barb is gone, and other times also. So welcome to you, Lois. Glad to have you here. All right, good. Um, what else? The thing that's on all of our minds these days is the terrible devastation, the tornadoes. Uh, down in the Midwest and southern states. Um, you've read all the reports. I'm sure you know what's going on as well as I do. My heart goes out to those people. I know you are compassionate and caring about them. I'm sure there will be um, opportunities in the days and weeks ahead to um, do things to help those people out. You know, I, I was thinking last night, <clears throat> I was thinking about those of us who think so much about Christmas trees and Christmas shopping and all that. Those folks don't even have homes anymore, a lot of them. They, they're not worried about Christmas trees, trust me. But they are worried about their next meal and their shelter. So please keep them in your prayers at minimum and when opportunities arise to do something to serve them and help them in the name of Jesus Christ, please do so if you, if you would. I think I've covered all the other announcements. Oh, oh, one more I wanted to mention. On uh, December 26th, the Sunday after Christmas, uh, Christmas Day, uh, is our traditional uh, Christmas uh, lessons and carols service. It's nine scripture readings and interspersed with Christmas music. I'm trying to find, and, and I'm getting help with this, but I'm trying to find nine readers. I need eight yet, at least, uh, to, to read those. And, and if I could get Carson, I'm looking, at what a, here's how it works. You start out with the youngest person you can find in the congregation who's a good reader. Carson, I'm looking at you. And then you work your way all up until the, either the pastor reads the last reading, the ninth, or another old person. I've already asked Bill Merritt, our congregational <laughs> president. He's not here today, so I can say that. Bill has agreed to um, begin the service with prayer, and then he'll read that last gospel reading on uh, December 26th. So it's a fun service, beautiful music, and I hope you can be here on December 26th for that service. Christmas Eve, we uh, have, I think, planned a little mini concert from 8.30 until 9 o'clock, and uh, the worship service on Christmas Eve, a single service, will be at 9 p.m. Just because I'm proud of it and I want to tell you, um, the church that I first served when I was fresh out of seminary, still wet behind the ears, as they say, downtown Detroit, lost their pastor last Sunday. Last Sunday was his last Sunday there. And so I called the bishop and I said, do they have anybody lined up to do Christmas Eve? And he said, no. And I said, well, if, if, you, if they can do a service earlier in the afternoon, I would go in and lead worship. So I'm going back to my first parish, downtown Detroit, for a 2 p.m. Christmas Eve service, and then I can be back here in time for our evening services. So I'm excited about it. Um, most of that congregation has changed in the 45 years that I have uh, been there but I'm looking forward to being with that congregation uh, as they celebrate Christmas Eve. Now, okay, I'm done, I promise. Those are my announcements. Let's begin with our gathering hymn, and if you don't know this one, it's a pretty tune. It's kind of a dance tune, so if you really want to get up and dance, go ahead, nobody will laugh. All right, let's begin with People Look East. Please remain seated for this. Planted there, 
Give up your strength, the seed to nourish That in course the flower may flourish People look east and sing today Love the roses on the way Stuck bounds with shouts of mirth Him who brings new life to earth Set every peak and valley humming With the word the Lord is coming People look east and sing today, love the Lord is on the way. Please stand as we begin our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, as we sing, as we sing this Kyrie, I've, I've reminded you of this a couple of times. Kyrie eleison, Latin, it means Lord, help us, Lord, save us. And today as we sing this, let's keep those folks who are uh, struggling and suffering, especially in our South and Midwest, as we pray for God's mercy in their lives. All right, let's sing. Kyrie, Kyrie eleison. On our world and on our way, Kyrie eleison every day. For peace in the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all. For this holy house, for all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord, Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way, Kyrie eleison, every day, that we may live out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor. That we may live out truth and justice and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let's pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For peace in our hearts, for peace in our homes, for friends and family. For life and for love, for our work and our play, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way. Son, every day for your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood let us pray to the Lord let us pray to the Lord Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way, Kyrie eleison every day. For our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Hallelujah. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power is 
which is wisdom and strength and honor, blessing and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the preaching of John, that rejoicing in your salvation, we may bring forth the fruits of repentance through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The first reading for today is from the book of Zephaniah. The prophet Zephaniah's message is mostly a judgment for sin. The reading, however, which comes from the conclusion of the book, prophesies joy for Judah and Jerusalem. Judgment has led to repentance and God's salvation is at hand. The reading. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, Shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A warrior would give, who gives victory, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will review you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the people of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read the psalm responsibly. Isaiah 12, verses 2 through 6. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and might, and has become my salvation. Joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known the deeds of the Lord among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Son glorious. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, 
for the great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This reading is for the third Sunday in Advent. Lawrence Madden, a Jesuit priest, asks, what needs to be born in you, in us, this Christmas? Have we as a community given up on a noble mission because our courage or stamina failed? Has the fever of our hope in the kingdom already arrived and is now cooling? There is no person frozen in destructive patterns that the Lord cannot free. Zephaniah's prophecy commands us to hope. The Lord is in your midst. Have confidence. Look into the darkness for the light. It may not resemble the Easter sun. It might be the fragile yet stable light of a star in the night sky. Christ is our hope even in the face of intimidating, paralyzing odds. He has baptized us in fire as John prophesied in Luke. We, the holy people of God, can dream of new birth because God's spirit dwells in us, powering us to always try anew. Today we light three Advent candles to help us see the presence of Christ in a world of deepening darkness. Light one candle to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel. God fulfills the promise. Light two candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall feed the flock like a shepherd, gently lead them homeward. Light three candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. Lift your heads and lift high the gateway for the King of Glory. <clears throat> the second reading for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Despite being in prison, Paul is remarkably upbeat as he writes this letter. Here, he urges his friends in Philippi to trust God with all their worries and concerns, with the hope that they will experience God's joy and peace. The reading. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? 
In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Believe it or not, folks, after hearing that gospel reading, we can still say that this third Sunday in Advent is Gaudete Sunday, or Rejoice Sunday, because that word rejoice keeps popping up again and again. And you may be wondering, how is it possible to rejoice in this difficult time we live in? But we do, we rejoice. Today, in my mind anyway, begins the, the, the start of what I would call my last minute gift shopping season. <sighs> I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that kind of puts off Christmas shopping until kind of the tail end, till a week before the big day. If you're like that too, then maybe you'll appreciate this heads up warning. It's time to start thinking about Christmas gifts. You know, when you get into that biblical account of Christmas and you hear about the wise men showing up, uh, we call it epiphany. The wise men, they came with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold for a king, very appropriate for Jesus. Frankincense, that waxy, oily kind of um, substance that when burned in a thurible, that's that little thing sometimes you see that priests swing and it smokes pouring out, you know, that frankincense burning and that. That's always associated in my mind with high church uh, traditions and holiness. And then there's a gift of myrrh that the wise men brought for Jesus. Myrrh, that pungent spice used in ancient times to wrap a body for burial. In the case of the Christ child, that gift of myrrh, I think, was an ominous foreshadowing of terrible things to come. But when you think about it, none of those gifts, well, except for the gold, I guess. Gold would make a hit any time. But none of those gifts would make a hit with our loved ones, I don't think, anyway. And if you can't seem to think of appropriate gifts to give, even here at this late date before Christmas, then may I suggest that possibly you need a personal shopper, okay? A personal shopper. Did you know that the New Testament offers a Christmas gift-giving guide? Yes, it does, it does. And it comes from a man that most of us would consider a strange candidate for a personal shopping consultant, John the Baptist. Here's a man who Matthew and Mark describe as wearing camel hair clothing. And, and again, not that nicely tailored camel hair jacket, but camel hair, smelly camel hair, and a leather belt around his waist. Are you sure you want to trust your, your needs for Christmas gifts to this fashion-impaired guy to shop for you? In describing John like this, Matthew and Mark, I think, are building a parallel between him and that great 
ancient prophet Ezekiel, the one that the Jews believed would be coming right before the Messiah. There's a connection there. Elijah is described in the Old Testament as a hairy man, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. And both Elijah and John spent a lot of their time in the wilderness. They hung out there and they ate whatever was at hand. And if you've heard these stories before, you know that for John, it was locusts and wild honey, not exactly my idea of fine eats. But John's message was a lot like Elijah's. It wasn't exactly what I would call feel-good religion. You brood of vipers, he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? With an inspirational message like that, you'd think that John wouldn't have had much of a crowd out there in the wilderness, but the surprising thing was he did. People kept turning out in droves. The crowds would come out to see him. I can picture them scrambling down the the muddy riverbank of the Jordan River where this wild man would almost drown them as he baptizes them. But John offers One thing, one thing that is so hard to find in this world of ours. And what is it? He offers the truth, the truth. What would you give? What would you do to hear the truth you could believe in? John calls the people to repent, literally to turn around, turn their lives around, away from the sins that kind of work their way into our lives and take over our souls and to prepare their hearts to welcome the Messiah. But what does that mean? What does that mean and what are the specifics here? Well, the crowds come to John and they ask those specifics. They want to know, so then what should we do? And John, did you catch it? John is not shy in his answers, not shy at all. Anybody that has two coats, raise your hand if you have two coats. Anybody that has two coats must share with those who have none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Boy, think of those people, Kentucky, man. Now, as I listen to this, what I'm hearing is a 50% charitable giving standard here for those who are mathematically inclined. Or if you've just gone to Burger King and you've ordered that two sandwiches for six bucks deal they have going for them down there at Burger King, and you sit down with you two, two Whoppers in front of you, and then you see that guy with his nose pressed up the gla- against the glass looking in at you. What does John say to do? <laughs> Take one of those Burger King Whoppers outside and hand it to that guy. Give half your lunch away. The gift of generosity. That's what John is talking about, isn't it? Well, there were some tax collectors there in the crowd. And yeah, they wanted to hear the truth too, so... Believe it or not, tax collectors do want to hear the truth. And so they came to John and said, John, what should we do? And what does he tell them? He says, collect no more than what you're obligated to collect. Be honest. Give the gift of honesty this season, he says. And then the soldiers, the soldiers come up to John, what about us? What should we do? And John doesn't hold back with them, not at all. Don't use your authority. Don't use your power. Don't use your uniform. Don't use that star on your chest. Don't use those stripes on your sleeve to extort money by threats or intimidation. And be satisfied with your wages. Justice. The gift of justice. So, Let's move this into our world here. What kind of gifts are appropriate for us today who take John seriously? Someone once wrote a a parable 
and it's stuck with me for many, many years, a parable about a man sitting alongside a river someplace enjoying his, his lunch peaceful afternoon when he notices a body floating down the river. So he sets down his food and he wades out into the water and he pulls this body into shore. The man is is alive, but just barely. And so he pulls him out and gives him first aid to save his life. And he no sooner than gets settled again when he sees another bedraggled, half-drowned soul floating down the river and then another after that and another. And he pulls each one of them out of the river and he saves their lives but the drowning and dying people just keep floating down the river. How long must this go on, the author of this little parable wonders, before the man finally decides to hike upstream and do something about whoever is injuring these people and throwing them into the water? I have to tell you, folks, I, I, I think I'm pretty honest with you. When I read this parable again, I couldn't help but think of all the children shot and killed in our nation's classrooms. Bodies floating down the river, you know? We're, we're pretty smart people. What do we know to do about that? And I wonder, is it that we don't know what to do or we just don't have the will to do something about it. The will to go upstream and find out what's happening and to make a change so our kids are no longer slaughtered in our streets. Martin Luther King Jr. makes a similar point in a speech he gave. He he was talking about that famous parable of Jesus, the parable about the Good Samaritan. Martin Luther King says this, On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their way on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. Let's be honest here. The truth is we have an opportunity to look, to look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth in our world today. And maybe we need to do that. Maybe it's time to do that. At least that seems to be what John the Baptist is telling us with his talk about giving away half the clothes in our closets and half the food on our plates, with treating other people with honesty and justice and generosity. You know, when you think about it that way, suddenly suddenly those Christmas gifts lists of ours take on a different character, don't they, when viewed through the wild and passionate eyes of John. Okay, I know Christmas is meant to give comfort to all of us with the good news of God's love for all people. But we don't get to Christmas without going through John, do we? John takes us to that place John takes us to that place with good news of God's love for all people, but he first takes us to that message that is meant to confront us with all the ways our world still isn't measuring up to God's standards of justice and calling on us to give those righteous gifts that make a real difference in our world. So, What is John the Baptist's advice, his Christmas gift-giving advice for us? How does he answer us when we too ask him, and what should we do? What should we do? What should we give? And John says it so plainly, so clearly. Give to the lost, to the least, to the lonely. Give them what they need the most. And if that isn't enough inspiration 
then look at Jesus, the true God and true man, who gave the world the best gift and the most, himself, his life. Isn't that how we honor our Lord and worship him in these Advent and Christmas days? Rejoice, rejoice, we hear in our lessons today, in our worship, rejoice. And even in these difficult times, there is much to rejoice for, for we now know what gifts to give at Christmas. Amen. Amen. delight. O kindle, Lord most holy, your lamp within my breast, to do in spirit lowly all that may please you best. I lay in fetters grown, but down to your thirst for my salvation procured my liberty. O Lord, beyond all telling that led you to embrace, in love all love excelling our lost and fallen race. Rejoice then, you sad-hearted, who sit in deepest gloom, who mourn your joys departed and tremble at your doom. All hail the Lord appearing, O glorious Son, now come, send forth your beam so cheering and guide us safely home. I might mention that that hymn was written by Paul Gerhardt, a name that probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but Paul Gerhardt lived during the, the, the pandemics of his age. He lost his wife and many children to the sickness, and uh, yet he could write a powerful hymn of, of praise and glory despite that. All right, I invite you now to stand and join me as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and all places that, who yearn for God's presence, saying, hear us, O God, and responding, your mercy is great. Let us pray. Most holy and loving God, renew your church in these days and raise up leaders who announce your good news. Grant peace to congregations and to seminary students in the midst of transition Guide the work of candidacy and call committees. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Most loving and creating God, your spirit brought forth the earth and all that is in it. Breathe life into us that we are inspired to live in harmony with one another and the planet. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
O shepherding God, you lead your people in paths of righteousness. Raise up prophets in our own day, prophets who warn against captivity to greed and point us to the freedom found in generosity. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Most nurturing and caring God, you come near in times of worry and stress and need. We remember those brothers and sisters suffering to recuperate and put their lives back together after the devastating tornadoes. Cradle us, Lord, especially those people in Mayfield, Kentucky. Cradle us in your arms that we might trust you and not be afraid. Attend to all who are hungry, imprisoned, or ill on this day. We pray especially for Tom and Courtney, Donna, Juliana, Mike, Kathy, Jerry, Rose, Tom, Betty, Linda, Sandy H., Cindy, Bill, Rosemary, Carrie, and Pastor Sarah. We also, Lord, pray for the family of Betty Campmuller, remembering especially her sons and her sister-in-law, Susie. Comfort them in their loss with her death. And we ask, Lord, your blessing also upon all those struggling with COVID-19 here in this state and throughout the United States and all over the world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. A rejoicing God, you exult over us in singing. Enliven the song of this gathered congregation and bless the ministry of church musicians. With instruments and with dance, join our voices to the song of all creation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. And we give you thanks, Lord, for your servants who show us your goodness and grace. By the power of your Spirit, keep us steadfast in faith until we make our home with you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we prepare to receive the sacrament as we confess our sins and hear God's word of pardon again. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. Let us now confess our sins, trusting in the tender mercy of our God. O God, for whom we wait, in the presence of one another, we confess our sins before you, We fail in believing that your good news is for us. We falter in our call to tend your creation. We find our sense of self in material wealth. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget that we are your children and we turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one, and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Jesus Christ has looked with favor upon you, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Your children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise, and recipients of God's divine mercy. God strengthens you anew to follow in the ways of peace. Amen. And now as we prepare the altar for the sacrament, I invite you, if you have uh, picked up uh, bread or a host in the back of the church as you entered, please get that out and be prepared to receive that. If you didn't, we certainly invite you to come forward and receive one at the front here. Um, As always, uh, during these COVID times, I will wear a mask and gloves, and our servers will wear gloves also as they distribute the wine. Let us consecrate these gifts of bread and wine. Most holy God, you alone are holy, you alone are God. 
The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We give you thanks for your dear Son, Jesus, who at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, in the same manner, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often in remembrance of me. We pray this day, Lord, for the gift of your Spirit in our gathering within this meal and among your people throughout the world. Blessing and praise and thanks to you, Holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit in the church, now and without end. Amen. And now with boldness let us pray as our Lord has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We feast on God's meal of love for us together, and if you have bread with you now that has been consecrated, I invite you to eat that, remembering that this is the body of Christ broken for you. Please be seated, and as you gather at the front, you can receive the bread here if you wish. Just please, I ask that you just open your hands so I may lay it in the palm of your hands, and then the wine will be set on a table for you to pick up.
Jesus said, I am the truth. Come and follow close to me. You will know me in your heart, and my word shall make you free. I receive the living one, and my heart is full of joy. I receive the living God, and my heart is full of joy. Jesus said, I am the life, far from whom no thing can grow, but receive this living bread, and my spirit you shall know. I receive the living God, and my heart is full of joy. I receive the living God, and my heart is full of joy. I invite you to stand as we conclude our worship in prayer and song this day. Most High God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all, through Christ Jesus, our host and our guest. Amen. And now the God of all hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen. And our ascending hymn today sounds to many like a Christmas tune, and it is, but it's also very appropriate for this, uh, the third Sunday in Advent. Joy to the world, rejoice, joy to the world. Please remain standing if you can. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room and have and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. No more let sin and sorrow grow, 
No thorns infest the ground He comes to make His blessings flow Far as the curse is found Far as the curse is found Far as, far as the curse is found He rules the world with truth and grace